Linen is my favorite textile material. Some of you may not know, but linen comes from the flax plant. That's right, the same plant that gives us flaxseed for our oatmeal can be woven into fabric as elegant as a linen suit or as humble as a hand towel. Flax fibers come from the stalk of the flax plant. The fibers lie just inside the outer bark of the stem and transport moisture from the roots to the flowering tip. In doing so, the fibers hold the plant upright. This function accounts for the incredible dimensional stability of linen. When constructed into a garment, linen will never sag or go limp. It will remain crisp and notoriously hold its wrinkles. Linen fibers are hydrophilic, which means they attract and move moisture. They also dry quickly, so a linen hand towel will never mold or mildew. Linen is also antibacterial, which is appropriate as linen was traditionally used as our undergarments and as bandages and body bags during wartime. What attracts me to linen is its character. Linen exemplifies how our materials have their own unique properties that are beyond our influence. These are based on how our fibers originate and how they occur in nature. As textile designers, we are constantly looking to our materials for inspiration, for expression, and to envision how we can utilize our materials to shape our future. I would like to invite you to imagine for a moment a world in which textiles didn't exist. Needless to say, this room would start to feel a lot more awkward, as you would all be naked. <laughs> but in any case, whether for comfort or utility, beauty or protection, textiles play an important role in our lives. They clothe our bodies and our interiors, from our homes to our vehicles to our places of work. With textiles being so ubiquitous, how do textile designers be begin to approach this field? Well, we use our visceral, we use our visual, sorry, and our tactile senses to select color, material, pattern, and texture. And we apply these to try to come up with solutions for our everyday needs. Take this carbon fiber fabric, for example, that I designed in collaboration with Fiat 500. The fabrics were required to be both structural and aesthetic. I was committed to portraying the high-end styling of Italian suiting, while also delivering on the functional requirements of a vehicle with an exposed chassis. But beyond the functional and aesthetic properties of cloth, how can we utilize our materials to establish deeper connections? between individuals, our communities, and our cultures. Canada has a long history of flax growing and linen weaving. I am very passionate about the revival of a linen industry in Nova Scotia. I would like to tell you a little bit about how I came to discover this passion, and also how you might be able to see cloth in a more meaningful way. In 2010, I had the opportunity to travel sorry, to move to Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, to carry out an artist residency. Lunenburg has a rich history of flax growing. In fact, when flax growing died out in the rest of Nova Scotia, it continued in Lunenburg until about 1910. So Lunenburg represented to me this forgotten part of our cultural heritage that I was curious to unearth. I moved there and I set out on a mission to carry out a systematic study of flax growing, processing, spinning, and weaving in order to revive these forgotten skills and share them with the community. I met farmers and local residents who were eager to share their land with me, and I planted flax in three locations using different seeding methods and qualities of seed. Over the next three months, I watched the flax as it grew. Linen is conducive to our climate and soil, so with no added chemicals or need for irrigation, the flax reached its full height of 90 centimeters and blossomed into a beautiful bed of purple flowers. I had the help of a very enthusiastic flax pulling team, and I spun these harvested fibers into linen yarn for weaving. As I cultivated the land, I volunteered at the local fisheries museum of the Atlantic. This museum showcases what life was like for early settlers to the region 
in a fishing village like Lunenburg. On the top floor of this museum, there was a group of volunteers who demonstrated how to spin wool for the public. I joined them once a week and demonstrated how to spin flax. As I spun, I spoke with museum goers. What struck me was how little is known about textile production. Not only the history of flax growing in Nova Scotia, but contemporary methods of manufacturing as well. By a show of hands, how many people know what material the shirt that they're wearing is made out of tonight? Some? How about where that garment is produced? A few less? And these are all trick questions, actually, because you're all naked, remember? <laughs> but the connections that I made in Lunenburg were incredibly valuable. Lunenburg is a small town with very engaged community members. So as people learned of my project, they approached me with artifacts of the flax culture that once was. In people's homes and barns scattered across the region were homespun fabrics, flax spinning wheels, and farm implements specific to the labor-intensive method of flax processing. Take this flax break, for example, that was found in a barn in Cherry Hill, just outside of Lunenburg. This tool is used to crack the outer bark of the plant in order to expose the fiber underneath. My time in Lunenburg was characterized by this interesting paradox. I saw that in just 100 years, the practice of flax growing and linen weaving had completely died out, and with it all knowledge of these skills. Yet these fabric, spinning wheels, and farm implements were like doorways into the past, showing me that this history is actually just within our reach. The Industrial Revolution proliferated in Great Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries. As it did, mechanically spun fibers began to replace homespun ones. This widespread industrialization is what we know of as the textile industry today. The short staple length of cotton fibers, grown in then British colonies like India, made it one of the earliest and easiest fibers to industrialize. Soon after, cotton began ex became exported across the globe, and this beat out domestic textile production of a diverse range of fibers, including linen. Fibers that come from the stalk of a plant are known as bast fibers. Bast fibers include linen, hemp, nettle, and even wisteria, rainy, mulberry, and pineapple, to name a few. The long length of bast fibers meant they were very difficult to industrialize. So as cotton spinning proliferated, Bass fiber spinning and weaving, which was central to so many indigenous and settler cultures, including our own, became almost extinct. In this picture, the wisteria fiber has been stripped from the branches of the trees and is hanging to dry. This picture was taken in the studio of Yushisha Fujifu, one of the last remaining wisteria makers in Japan today. Take these fibers. Wisteria thread is on the right, pineapple in the center, and hemp on the left. Even banana fiber can be woven to create cloth. There's only a few remaining craftspeople today who can produce this fabric. How do we come to recognize and protect textiles as the valuable resources they, that they are? In our current era of low-cost, high-volume fashion that has such commercial appeal, it might seem counterintuitive that textiles and fashion need saving. But what if I told you that a lack of material diversity is a major concern facing the textile industry today? In 2008, more than 80% of clothing sold was comprised of just two textile fibers, cotton and polyester. The scale at which these fibers are being produced is leaving a devastating environmental impact. Cotton is regarded as one of the most energy-intensive and polluting crops in the world. Heavy pesticide use and water irrigation is putting a large strain on resources, especially in countries like India and Ethiopia that are already water-starved. So what would a local textile industry have to offer? In our dependence on a global production chain, we fail to recognize the material diversity that exists in our own backyard. 
Fibers that grow native to a region or that can be cultivated there are well adapted to meet the needs of local conditions. Take linen, for example. Linen's ability to move moisture and dry quickly make it an excellent material for our hot and humid summers. In contrast, cotton, which is grown in more hot and arid regions, is better able to cool the body in dry conditions. Local fiber production is also better able to reduce the environmental impact caused by a large-scale, globally dispersed production chain. Native fibers like linen, hemp, and nettle can be grown without the need for heavy herbicides, pesticides, or irrigation. They also reduce the carbon footprint, as these goods do not need to be transported vast distances to reach the consumer. Local production is also more scale appropriate. It's better able to consider all components of the life cycle of a, of a cloth, from raw material to textile waste, and this was so well illustrated in Fairchild's talk earlier. Recently in the press, it was noted that 11 billion kilograms of textile waste from North America is shipped overseas each year. 11 billion kilograms. 85% of that is destined to be burned or put in landfill. Local textile production also encourages more transparency about how our textiles are produced and where they're made. This creates more knowledgeable consumers, and more knowledgeable consumers influence more sustainable practices. How would we treat our clothing differently if we knew where it was produced, or the people who produced it? Design critic Donald Norman acknowledges the emotional connection that we have with our objects. If an object's aesthetic can give us a sense of joy, or its story engender a sense of place or belonging, then we're more likely to use it. Applied to textiles, how would we use our clothing more effectively, wear it for longer periods of time, or take more loving care of it? This is so relevant in our era of fast fashion. So what if textiles could truly embody the values and aesthetics of our culture? If instead of turning to a global brand for identity, we could turn to the biodiversity of our region, whether this comes from our raw materials or our natural dye plants. Take this weaving by Anna Haywood Jones, for example, using natural dyes collected from goldenrod plants harvested locally. How can we begin to use the land as a resource to define a regional aesthetic that truly reflects our diversity as it exists today. The local food movement is an inspiring example of how a shift from global to local is possible. An important component of the local food movement is food security. Food security ensures that food is safe, healthy, and accessible to all people in a region. It is a measurement of availability, affordability, and acceptability. I believe we need to consider our textiles or our material security in a similar way. Ensuring that textiles are available, affordable, and produced in an acceptable way is a key responsibility of our generation. And I'd like to emphasize the measure of acceptability here because it places the focus on our individual and our collective values. How sustainable a fiber is to produce, how culturally relevant a textile design is, or how ethically a garment can be made are all acknowledged here. My time in Lunenburg was like a microcosm for what is possible, to bring local textile industry back to Nova Scotia. The excitement of the community in Lunenburg to learn these skills and participate in the process of making taught me that self-sustainability is a deep human need. Not only does it fulfill our basic need for clothing and protection, but it also fulfills a deeper need for connectedness that we all desire. Thank you very much. <laughs>